thank you for coming to, uh, what time is it now? It's a super early morning talk, right? Um, and as demonstrated by the fact that the person who I'm speaking with is currently recovering outside. So, um, and I hope if he does come in, and I hope he does, uh, make sure to be very uh, welcoming to him because this will be his first time um, helping to do a talk of some sort. And we're both here for the same reason, as you can see the title there of why Americans are moving to Germany and such. And um, there are two primary audiences for this talk and two reasons that we're given it. The first is that things are getting really bad in the US right now. And you guys may have, how many people here know who Snowden is, for example? Okay, easy crowd. So that's one, there's actually a lot more stuff going on that we'll, we'll, try, we'll try to cover within this talk. And on the other side, we want to um, show there are maybe a lot of Americans who are on the precipice of, well, I feel hopeless, or life is not going so well, what should I do, do, do I have a way out? And this is kind of a call for help and maybe even reaching out to the community of Germany because there are some really great things that I have found here in the years that I've been coming to Congress and so on. And uh, I, I myself have moved to Germany as about a month ago, so um, I'm still in the honeymoon phase and I can go over some of the details that we're getting into. So this talk is intended both for the Americans looking to jump ship as well as the Germans who are wondering, well, what's so great about Germany anyways? Did that change? Ah, there we go. So yeah, I don't know how many of you have seen this news article and this is um, indicative of probably at least many of you are probably aware of the title of Berlin's Digital Exiles, where a lot of people are coming over right now. And in this case, it's to escape the NSA and the surveillance apparatus that has come along. And um, there's some really bad stuff going on. So what is the problem? So here's a big one, and this is actually the wealth inequality in the U.S. has been going on for a very long time, and I could get I could go on for an entire hour about all the uh, socioeconomic reasons, but um, as you can see here, um, those are the poor people, and the rich are actually so rich that if you you can't even see the top of it, like we say in with Occupy, if you guys remember that we had the one percent and the ninety nine percent, well it's actually closer to the point zero 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 one percent and everyone else. I think something like a quarter of America's wealth is concentrated within about 400 rich people, um, mostly the Walton family and whatnot. And there's also an illustrative photo here. Uh, you can see there's a, a homeless man next to a really rich man. And there's this really uh, unhealthy juxtapose that's going on. And my own personal story, I'm coming from the San Francisco Bay Area, and there have a, there's a, some really bad wealth inequality issues going on there right now. And there's a housing crisis, and there's also the... Uh, weather issues and whatnot, but it's important to note that this is not a new thing. This has been a creeping problem that has been happening over the course of decades. It's been a series of really um, maybe poorly thought out laws that have been enacted. Um, thanks Reagan and thanks Bush, for example. So the problem that means is that it's a very deep rooted issue and it's not going to go away anytime soon. Beyond that, we also have corporate power. So on the right here, or on the left here, um, by the way, one of the things I will get to in a bit, Germany has amazing health insurance and health coverage. America uh, is effectively non-existent. It might as well be a third world country. Um, I have another hour long rant about that. But you got the little comic on, on the left side there. And on the right side, there's two comments I want to make about that image up top. First, you see the political parties, the Democrat and Republican, the elephant and the donkey, where they're effectively hailing allegiance to the party and not actually having a discussion. And that kind of describes the political gridlock that's going on in the US right now between Congress, which is controlled by Republicans, and uh, the White House, which is democratic, which means they're basically not doing anything. Um, and it's actually led to a government shutdown, among other things. But the other more nefarious point that's involved, it's not actually a political party issue because they don't work for their respective parties, they work for the corporations who are giving them money to pay for their campaigns. Uh, for example, Hillary Clinton, who recently announced that she was running, she was holding off for several months and years really, saying that she was announcing her bid for presidency because if you have not yet officially announced you're going to run for president, you're not officially campaigning, which means you are not subject to campaign finance laws which means the, the Clinton Foundation was able to pull in all kinds of money, and I think that they've raised over a billion dollars. Um, so it's basically going to be this next 2016 presidential debate, or uh, presidential race, it's going to be the Democrats, namely Hillary Clinton and all the uh, rich people that gave her money, and uh, the GOP as funded by the Koch brothers. 
And um, if you notice, the U.S. citizens are not really included in here anywhere. And that's kind of the, the feeling and kind of the resentments that have been brewing up. And the other thing that relates to a lot of you is um, there's a law called the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. Uh, have you guys heard of it at all? So this dates back. So question: Have you any of you seen the movie War Games? Yeah, from 1983, Matthew Broderick and all that. So one of the things that happened after War Games came out, it scared a bunch of politicians, and in 1986 they passed this law called the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. So remember, computers and networking in the 80s were very different, which means that instead of like logging into Google and such as we have now, you actually had to make a dial-up connection to another computer and so on. So this phrase in here, knowingly, knowingly accessed a computer without authorized or exceeding authorized access, made sense in 1986. And not so much today. And there are a number of instances of people who are being tried under this. And uh, my, uh, the, the, the person who is outside recovering right now is one of them. And he has a story that um, hopefully he'll be able to share. Um, I, I guess I could give a little bit of his story, though. He uh, was part of the PayPal 14. Are you guys familiar with that? So when WikiLeaks happened in uh, 2010, it pissed off a lot of politicians, especially. And um, it, it was PayPal, among other places, uh, effectively blockaded um, payment processing going to WikiLeaks and uh, similar organizations. And um, my uh, co-speaker was one of the people who got involved um, by taking political action and DDoS in uh, PayPal. And this created a whole bunch of problems and... Uh, Long story short, he has a whole story about how he was raided by the FBI for it, and uh, a bunch of people were grouped in this room and collectively became known as the PayPal 14. Ironically, they all became good friends out of this. Like, they didn't really, ki they kind of sort of knew each other. It was a community, but they became good friends after all of the, the legal issues, which he is still dealing with. And honestly, one of the reasons uh, which he would say that he has moved to Germany is because if he applies for a job, he puts it in his application, and the employer then Googles his name. And they Google his name, and the result is the PayPal 14 lawsuit. And American employers are terrified of liability, and they don't want to get sued for anything. And they're basically, anything even remotely controversial is toxic to them. So they see this major lawsuit and, you know, years-long trial and whatnot. And um, let's just say that he is having trouble finding work, and things are much more open and hospitable in Germany for him. Um, the, but, and it's not just him. There are other um, people involved in this. I'm thinking of Chelsea Manning. I'm thinking of Jeremy Hammond and uh, many more. And one of the problems with uh, this law and the way it's being applied right now, by the way, is stifling security research. And I could get into some of that in a bit, too. So why Germany? Well, I am biased because I've been coming to uh, the CCC, the Congress, since 25C3 was my first. I helped out with the uh, the Sputnik project, if you guys saw that, RFID tracking. And uh, we've also found the community here to be incredibly welcoming, and everyone is very nice. And also the healthcare, the fact that... Um, I, I'm a bit speechless because the healthcare here is just unbelievably amazing. The fact that people are not worried that if they get into an accident or get sick, then they might go bankrupt. Or, uh, or otherwise or get denied healthcare claims and so on. There are a lot of problems with America and a lot of those simply don't exist in Germany. Admittedly, Obamacare, when it went through in 2010, it did fix a lot of things. So for example, the pre-existing conditions issue, wherein if you have a pre-existing condition of any illness or ailment, insurance companies simply would not cover you. They would just deny you. So you would go to the hospital and you would either get turned away because you didn't have health insurance, or you get, would get a bill for $150,000. So that's just kind of how it is in the U.S. The only way to really get health insurance is to have a job, which is also why the whole situation with the job transients and job insecurity makes people afraid. It's not just the economic risks. It's because if you lose your job, you lose your health insurance, and that's a death trap. Another thing that's really uh, interesting, so there are really very few public places left in the United States. So for example, Occupy Wall Street, that was held in Zuccotti Park in New York City. That was actually privately owned. And that was one of the reasons they were able to clear it out. Um, I think the UN Plaza in San Francisco, correct me if I'm wrong, Mitch, is that a public place? So there are a few, but they're being eroded away. One of the reasons, for example, I think that hacker spaces have been so popular is because you, we like to have places to hang out and to associate and get to know our communities. And at the moment in the US, most of that is like Starbucks. 
and most of it you have to pay to exist or you have to be there for, with a purpose instead of hanging out and getting to know people and such. So it's something very powerful. And the other thing is the Chaos Computer Club. And perhaps um, it, it might be hard to understand how amazing this is if you're used to it and take it for granted, but the CCC is one of the most amazing organizations I've ever found, partly because there's a community and partly because they look beyond just the technology. They use technology as a means to other things. And in the US, we sort of have that. So we have the Electronic Frontier Foundation, which is very useful, but kind of limited in scope. And it's, it's uh, for those unfamiliar, it's a collective of lawyers who help um, defend people who have been uh, accused of computer-related crimes, such as the CFAA. And we also have um, some organizations like 2600 and a few other things, but there is nothing as robust and also as universally respected as the CCC seems to be. In the US, uh, computer hacking is viewed as nefarious, as criminal, and I think that's one of the reasons we're seeing all these prosecutions, and it's also because the prosecutors want to make a name for themselves, whereas here it seems that people are open to it and they like the exploration of computers. Am I rambling on too much? What's that? Okay. Yes, and I fully admit in some of this talk, the grass may be greener, and remember I'm in my honeymoon period. But this is what we get if we try to stand up in the streets. Um, if you don't know what this is, um, a lot of local police municipalities in the country, in America, and this is mostly because of Occupy, and they're trying to figure out what the hell do we do. Uh, mayors of the different American cities actually had conference calls with Department of Homeland Security about this. So the DHS has been taking excess um, equipment that I guess the military didn't need anymore and given it as in the form of grants to local law enforcement. So this one is in Tampa. This is a police tank that is rolled out to break up protests that are going on, nonviolent protests. I have personally seen tanks like this in the streets when I was involved in Occupy Oakland as a legal observer. And it's fucking scary. So you have this, you also have police wearing the riot gear and the tear gas. And I don't know if you guys have been tear gas, but it's really not fun. And you know where the funding for all this stuff is coming from? DHS. And I just want to show you the face of um, this woman. I've forgotten her name. Um, and this was taken from, I think, Occupy Portland or Occupy Seattle. Uh, I believe she's a Holocaust survivor, actually. And she came out because she didn't like what was going on in the US. And um, her face is covered with mace. And that is how American police treat our elders. So. If you rise up, if you dissent, if you uh, voice something that is different from the status quo in the United States, well, watch out. And that's not all. We have, uh, and this, this is something I could give a very long talk on. Um, are you guys familiar with the concept of fusion centers? So fusion centers, um, something analogous to this could be the London CCTV network, where there are cameras on every street corner and they're recording all the license plates and everywhere you go and whatnot. So the DHS has been basically in secret funding a lot of these um, fusion centers, which they have street cameras, they have uh, license plate readers, uh, some of them f uh, bring in social media feeds. Uh, they have ShotSpotter. ShotSpotter is a tool that listens to audio for gunshots, and if it determines there is one, then it tries to triangulate it. And then it, some places consider that probable cause to issue a warrant. It depends on the state and the municipality. So this is fucking scary. And this is what's going on in the United States right now. On the top, you have a guy who's basically playing Peep and Tom and watching everything that's going on. And uh, just a bit of shameless self-promotion. This, the DHS did approach Oakland, California, where I lived until about a month ago, and wanted to set something like this up. And the people of Oakland rose up and said, no, this is not okay. And um, after seven straight months of protests at City Hall, they decided to create an ad hoc committee to create the first privacy policy of its kind in Oakland to fight back against this um, overarching, um, basically tyrannical crap. And I was appointed to the committee, so uh, I could give uh, like a week-long seminar on all the intricacies of this. But basically, there are two standards that ought to be used that Snowden, in particular, has been suggesting we use reasonable suspicion and probable cause. Anybody versed in law is familiar with those. And those will be incorporated into the Oakland privacy policy. None of these other places are doing that. So we're hoping that with this policy that we can establish something and set up a system that does help reduce crime and so on, and then point to the NSA and all these other fusion centers. And by the way, basically every city, there's um, DC, Boston, Chicago, New York, um, they all have them and none of them really seem to have privacy policies at all. In fact, most citizens of these cities are unaware that these systems have even been set up. They usually just kind of slip by in the private. 
in uh, city hall meetings and such. And all of these things don't really spell happiness. And this is where we get people like, this is, these are pictures of the PayPal 14, but it's not just them. And actually the top left there is um, Insane, who would be my co-speaker, except I think he is uh, hopefully getting better after last night. And they're not alone. And these are the people who, some of them are wondering, what do I do? Where can I go? And one of the reasons for doing this talk is to show you guys, things are not so great in the US right now. And if there are people who are looking at uh, like brighter pastures, perhaps we could work together and uh, create an easier process for them. Because I will say, coming to Germany is not the easiest thing to do. It's, uh, besides the fact that it's expensive, there's all these legal things. And uh, if you don't have a, basically 40 hours a week to study all the intricacies of German law, it becomes very difficult. So some of the things that I really appreciate about Germany, and because why the hell are we even looking here? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, this, for example, this does not exist in the United States. It's solely distributed in Germany. Uh, um, it, it, it depends, there's a couple of choice stores through a funny little thing, but in general, I cannot go to the grocery store and get Club Mate. And as you can imagine, I have two cases of it at home right now. Um, it is quite good. Um, also, Doner Kebab doesn't exist. Oh my god, that stuff is so good. I lived off of Doner Kebab and Club Mate for the first week I was here. Um, as many, of, I see you smile and I see you guys can relate. But there's all kinds of little things like that within Germany. And what we have found is that the stress level is just um, almost non-existent compared to what we're used to. People here seem to have a sense of job security. There isn't this notion that, well, in the United States, most of the states are what we call at-will states, which means that you can either quit your job for any reason, or more importantly, you can be fired at any time for no reason whatsoever. And um, a lot of, and yes, the United States does have anti-discrimination laws, so you cannot be fired because you're black, for example, or turned down for a job. However, a lot of companies are saying, oh, well, we don't think you're a cultural fit. And that, that yeah, that, that's kind of a twisted way of doing it all, and it, it's allowed them to do some really horrible things. What's that? Oh, okay, I thought you made a motion. Never mind. So, in general, things are really tense, because if you have um, very little job security, and you're not really sure, and there's this idea of loyalty, but loyalty doesn't exist if all the companies are run by sociopaths who want to make more and more and more money um, without actually giving any money back to the community, which is one of the things that we're dealing with right now. In fact, a lot of places, so two things in San Francisco and New York and a couple of other cities have been happening. First, the cost of living has been skyrocketing. Um, I didn't put this in the talk, but I found um, there was somebody who her landlord, this was a couple months ago, her rent was like, I think 2000 a month, which is actually kind of cheap for San Francisco. And she got a letter in the mail saying that next month your rent is going to be $8,000 a month. So yeah, it was quadrupled. And this is completely legal. And um, there are things like rent control, if you have rent control. However, there's also um, LS Act evictions. Basically San Francisco law, they can evict you from your place if it remains vacant for a year with the intent that they're going to rip down the building and build fancy condos that only uh, tech workers who make over $100,000 can afford. So that's kind of the, the, the feeling. So that doesn't exist here. And there's community. When I got into Germany, I remember because I was first living in Prenzlauerberg and uh, in, in Berlin and walking down the street and seeing young children toddlers and, and, and strollers seeing old people, it's something I haven't seen in a very long time and I really liked it. There's, there's actually a diversity in a community here. And just all kinds of little things like that. People just, uh, okay, I will stop now, but uh, I just, I, I'm really enjoying my time here thus far. So those are kind of the reasons that I am seeing. Obviously, there's a lot of things about Germany I do not know yet. Uh, for example, I didn't know there was a cathedral in Cologne until I got here yesterday and it's absolutely gorgeous. Yeah, 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 ignorant American. So one of the things we're trying to do is create a list of resources if somebody is interested in learning, well, is Germany right for me? Or is there another country I should look for? If I want to do it, what do I have to do? Is, is it worth it? Is life actually going to be better here? And we want to give people the information so they can make a choice like that for themselves. But also, if you make a choice, that means you are not trapped into something that's making you unhappy. And beyond that, we have, um, we're trying to put people in contact with lawyers and fixers. I think a fixer is somebody who can hook you up with a, a visa processing thing. And uh, also, there's all kinds of things. I barely understand this stuff myself. And the other thing is if somebody we think maybe as a community belongs in the CCC, um, maybe they're doing really cool art projects or they're a brilliant hacker of some sort, but they cannot afford it. 
And maybe it's because like in uh, my co-speaker's situation, he cannot get a job because everyone Googles his name and finds all this uh, lawsuit stuff that scares them. Well, if they can't afford to, but they should, perhaps we should have a process by which we could do fundraising to make sure that quality people are able to be part of this community. And in general, we just, uh, th these are ways to get in touch with us. Is that, oh, hi, McFly. In general, these are some ways to get in touch with us. This is me on Twitter and uh, McFly, who's over there, that is his jabber. And uh, my uh, co-speaker, who is currently out, um, hopefully getting better, is uh, right there, so you can get a hold of us. And um, beyond that, we just want to say thank you to a few people here who have been instrumental in helping all of this to uh, become. So I think that's basically all I can think of to ramble about right now. Are there any questions? Was I too fast? Oh, question. Um, I'm German, so I don't. Yeah. yeah. I'm I'm German, so I'm not so familiar with the laws that govern how long you're allowed to stay here. What are the conditions? If you're just a guest, are you a tourist? Is it a tourist right. visa? And so how if, does that work? Yeah. So if you come in there, I think it's a tourist visa that you're on, and you can be here. God, this is complicated. Oh, okay. Yeah, give it to him. I, so I've. Uh, lived in Germany off and on for about two years over the past six years. Um, so right now we're here on the Schengen visa. So we have 180 days once you enter the region that you can be within the area, but you only can stay within it for 90 days out of the 180. And so you have to leave with whether your 90 days are up or your 180 days are up. So uh, if you use all 90 days in one, one go, that means you then have to leave and you can't come back until the end of the original 180 days. So it's effectively a six month visa, but you can only be here for three months out of the six months total. Um, but if you play it right, you can actually come into the region for like one day, leave, come back three months later, stay for three months, leave for one day, come back, stay for another three months, and then you've had six months in the, in the region, but then you can't come back again for three more months. Um, but <clears throat> getting a work visa here, um, technically you're not allowed to come to Germany under a tourist visa and get a job under the tourist visa, um, but you can't get a work visa without being in the country to fill out all the paperwork and do the interviews. And so it's actually illegal for a person to come in under a tourist visa to do these things, but it's also illegal for a company to bring you here without you having done that yet. So it's kind of um, a catch-22. So everyone comes in under the tourist visa, and then they sometimes have to leave and come back, and it's a really weird little step because the tourist visa cannot turn into a work visa. Um, but that's pretty easy. And then there's a secondary, or like one of the more common visas that I was looking at having, um, it's a self-work visa. So you can be a self-employed artist or, uh, you know, I do open source hardware and electronics, so this is what I was looking at. And uh, they only care about you having um, 10,000 euros in the bank. And so if you can, it doesn't even have to be your money. And they even say this, um, if you can raise 10,000 euros in capital to have sit in a bank account for four to six weeks, then, you know, they, they generally think that you might be a person that you're not going to get stranded here. You know, for you to be able to borrow that, that kind of money uh, means that you're not a poor person effectively, uh, which is what they're trying to, to keep out. Um, but that was the one that I was looking at uh, being here. So. Yeah. <laughs> um, I can comment something. This uh, normal visa is the same for other countries as well, and also for the US. I know it the other way around for somebody um, is doing the exact other thing. He's coming from Germany and working in, in the US and wants to stay there. Uh, so it's the same uh, the other way around. So it's not typically for Germ or Europe or something. It's not just as visas go. Significantly, it's significantly easier for an American to just come here and hang out um, because I can come here without a job. Um, well, you know, I'm telling them I'm self-employed and I am self-employed, but um, it's still, um, there's no way that somebody can come to the U.S. and just say, I'm going to hang out unless you are very, very rich. Um, so I think in the U.S. it's like $10 million if you have like $10 million in a U.S. bank account. Um, actually, it's in Germany too. You get a permanent visa if you have 10 million euros in a German bank. It's not a joke. 
Uh, most countries have this. Um, if you're a wealthy person, you can stay in almost any country indefinitely. Uh, but in the U.S., they don't have such a visa as like here where I can have a five-year visa to live here indefinitely. Um, so, yeah. Wow. Yeah, things like that are what we need to put on a page and communicate with people. So, Because I, I knew about half of what you just said. So. <laughs> well, it was just after like, living this for two yeah. years. Oh, it's okay. Okay, any other questions? Ah, Mitch, okay. So we're in a place in the world where not all that many decades ago, uh, people fled. And they went to, well, many went to France, where it seemed like it was a pretty cool place. And not too long later, they found that that was uh, kind of being overrun by the same forces. Uh, and some of them went to China. In fact, I know some they people who fled to China to become more free. Uh, well, that was back then. Oh, okay. Before you know, they had a, a republic. And um, uh, in fact, a friend of mine, his grandfather, went there, and uh, and then a few years later, uh, they had to flee there, and they ended up being in Turkey of all places. So um, I'm just wondering. Um, Right now, the United States is kind of a powerful force. Um, Europe seems to follow in footstep when, with whatever the United States does. In France, they just enacted their version of the so-called U.S. Patriot Act. Um, here, at least, um, there's some pushback with the recent re revelations on the NSA spying here. But... Um, you know, it's known that the NSA and the equivalent of the Secret Service here are just trading their spying data. So I'm wondering if this is... This is really a really good question. So there's a couple of points to make to this. And first off, the things that Snowden revealed, all the NSA stuff, is not the worst things going on in the United States right now. Um, the worst thing, in my opinion, are the data brokers like Axiom and Experion and TransUnion and such. Because um, basically, if you use Facebook, all of your data is being sold to one of them. And that has actually led to some issues because uh, I believe Germany has a, lot, a law called the Telemedia Act by which... Um, Basically, all of your data is protected by law. In the U.S., that is not the case. In the U.S., it, your medical, your financial, your, I think your college transcript, like education records, and ironically enough, video rental records are protected. And basically, everything else is completely fair game. And there's all kinds of ways to interpret around that. And it's actually the subject of a lawsuit, Germany versus Facebook, which um, I I know that was going on a couple of years ago. I haven't followed up with it, but it was basically over things like that. The idea that um, the, the idea that these laws are kind of conflicting. So one of the differences I want to point out is that I have seen, at least in Germany, people seem to be much more. It's not that they're politically active. It's more that um, in the U.S. there's this feeling of disconnect that no matter what you do and no matter what you want, the federal government is just going to do whatever the hell that they want, including you know wage these horrible wars and such. And it seems like at least in uh, Germany there's a sense of community that thinks that they can make a difference and they actually do go to things like city hall meetings and such and maybe teach technology or try to get better policies done and so on. So it seems to me at the moment that it is stronger here than it is in the U.S. And perhaps that is because I have not seen police tear gas and like bulverized protesters with uh, tanks in the street, but I don't know. What? Oh. This does exist in Germany too, but as long as you don't use webs, you're usually not arrested. Like, if you go to Hamburg, my city, in May 1st, or to Berlin in May 1st, you will find some strange things going on. And there were some protests when they were using uh, this gas at some people. Sometimes there's really, really big protest afterwards. Not at every uh, protest. It depends on the protest as well. But uh, it's not in general accepted. 
Well, the, uh, so another thing that I've noticed about Germany that I think is really profound is that there seems to be a very uh, good separation of work and life balance. So um, uh, it's not just the vacation, although the vacation is amazing. The fact that you have encoded in a law that I believe you must have at least four weeks of vacation a year. Um, whereas with America, you're lucky if you get two weeks and then you have to kind of fight to justify it going off and taking the vacation because you're costing the employer money by not working for them. Um, just, uh, I was going somewhere with that, but I forgot, so. <laughs> but the, there, there are a lot, oh, right, right. So the work-life balance, one of the things that we run into in San Francisco in particular, and I'm kind of harping on that because that's the area that I have been living in for years and I moved here from. Um, in San Francisco, a lot of people get a job, especially if it's at one of the big places like Google, Facebook, and so on. And, well, they don't really have very good boundaries and they don't have any life outside of their work, which means that their personal identity becomes their job and therefore everything that the company does, the company line, becomes they and themselves. So the idea of actually marching out and protesting something, well, that requires believing in something that is not necessarily the party line of your job. So it seems that at least in Germany, there's a much healthier balance where people are able to have lives outside of work. And for example, if you um, voice a political opinion, you won't get fired from your job here as far as I have seen. That happens all the time in the US, except that you're just not a cultural fit. Any more questions? I cannot tell if you are confused or if it is simply the flat affect of Europeans. Um, just, just one more. Um, do you... What what do you think would be the impact of a, a lot of Americans in Germany? And it doesn't have to be Berlin. I mean, uh, Cologne's cool. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, what I immediately thought of, does everyone know the concept of the September that never ended? <laughs> and so on. That was the September of 1993 where AOL came online and suddenly people flooded into the internet and the, uh, the culture of Usenet and everything else began to drain away. Um, so there is a risk of that. Um, I think as long as a flood would be controlled and there would be people who volunteer and are willing to act as mediators to make sure that um, people are both taken care of and they learn the cultural boundaries and, uh, I, I guess, notions and learn how to uh, respect them, I think that it could be very peaceful. So, for example, um, one thing that Americans are very guilty of is walking into a store in Europe and trying to pay with American dollars because they for don't realize that other countries have different currency. So. It's so fucking stupid that, that actually happens. So did that answer the question at all? So some of it we just don't know because, I, yeah. You know, clearly, you know, uh, any city would, would profit yeah. from an influx of a lot of, you know, uh, gifted, intelligent, you know, people who want to do something. And, um, and I'm just trying to picture Berlin and how it would, or any city, how it would be changed if you started coming in larger numbers. Mm. Well, the, and the reason I say Berlin is just because I know people in Berlin and I've been to Berlin for, you know, Congress at BCC and such. Um, so the issue there is that I just don't know enough about Germany and enough about the cities. That's why we're reaching out to you guys to see if uh, people have more information to share. So, well, Yep. I think if you watch the internet and have some friends in America, you will realize that there actually are a lot of Americans in different phases from being slightly interested in moving to Germany to, I really want a GTFO here, how do I do this? Um, but I don't think it's the numbers that would come close to the eternal September. So I think God, if I we hope spread not. it between Hamburg, Berlin, and Cologne, and maybe one or two other cool cities in Germany. Does anyone here still have a stack yeah. of the AOL CDs from like the mid '90s? Yeah, <laughs> they're good for coasters. Um, they still work. They still work the AOLs from the CDs from yeah. the '90s. There are a few AOL dial-up subscribers still sticking around. So. <laughs> Do you think we should do this for people from other countries as well? I mean, you're talking about America specifically, but there are people that actually have to flee their country because they're persecuted. 
for some reason. And um, I think this is a great thing that you're trying to set up here, um, but maybe we could just broaden it for other people. Yes, and the reason that I have not uh, mentioned that is because I am not from those other countries and I don't want to speak on their behalf, but I think that, yes, it's a very welcome discussion. What, did that not answer the question? Oh, okay. Like somebody from Syria, I've never been to Syria and I don't know that much about the culture except for all the horrible things that I see in the news and I don't think that it would be very uh, prudent of me or right and just, just to speak on their behalf, so. Oh. I'm a little worried that we wouldn't be that welcoming as we are to Americans either, so. Any other questions? Yes, maybe uh, this is also a little bit answering the other question because I think in Germany we are um, they are getting people from different directions, different countries, and we have a more mixed country from the population than only Americans. So if there would be a lot of Americans, that maybe would be balanced with other countries as well. Yeah, and this is just a kind of a hypothetical thinking ground. I mean, beyond that. How can Germany or people within who have that kind of stability offer support to people who are in America who do not desire to come here but want to help to, say, rein back all the horrible things that are going on right now? So it's a group effort. One of the points with, like, I need to possibly say I'm half guilty for this talk too because one of the ideas was to actually make people here also aware that there are people basically fleeing their country and living on my couch who are not also from the classical refugee countries that I think most intelligent and thinking and people who are open-minded and see their city and what's going on. I think we have a lot of that in Hamburg at the moment. But if you just are surrounded by those people and just bring up the idea of who oh, there are other people who have legal issues, like the guy living on my couch who basically also fled America, uh, who was supposed to stand there and talk if we didn't enjoy Germany too much, I assume. Um, but yeah, one of the points is to make people aware that yes, refugees are there and a lot of them come over the Mediterranean Sea or in other ways. Uh, but we will, and this is not so obvious also have refugees from other countries like, like America and this if you look in the me media uh, it's by far not the f first ones and if you happen to see a guy walking around who looks kind of pale and maybe sickly you should ask him how it was when the FBI raided his place <laughs> How do your friends in, in the U.S. react on your decision or your plans? It's very mixed. Um, some of them are either supportive or jealous because maybe they have been over for Congress or something or they want to come to Europe and they've never been. Um, others are scared. There's a fear because, I mean, a lot of Americans, I, I think the statistic I last saw was only 20% of Americans have a passport. So it is not very common for Americans to leave the United States, period, like, you know, go on a weekend trip or something. So there's a lot of apprehension around that. Um, I don't know that anybody has, how to put it, um, nobody has like been hostile and said that you are leaving because you've given up or something like that. And clearly, if things in America get better, and if I can help them get better from afar, I would maybe go back someday. But at the moment, it's uh, very difficult. So it, it also depends on, um, there's the difference between um, the idea of you leaving and the concept of just going to a different country and who it is. Like if it is your mother or if it is your, uh, I don't know, friends or something like that versus a coworker, the coworker is probably less likely to care. They might think it's an interesting idea. One thing I do recall is that Americans are very, very good at complaining. And uh, the number of Americans that actually stop complaining and do something is very small. So I have had some people say, wow, you actually did it. I didn't think you would. So maybe complaining is a universal trait. I don't know. Oh. Um, have you ever known about people who are coming from Germany to um, the USA because there are some and do you know 
why they want to do that? <laughs> My guess, uh, the ones who I have known who have done that have come exclusively to get jobs in the Bay Area because they pay a lot. Um, there are so many uh, barriers, like I think the H-1B visa and whatnot, and plus you have to do a retinal scan and give a thumbprint and all that in order to enter the U.S., which um, that's another rant altogether. But um, usually it's almost entirely... So actually there's two reasons. It could be either economic, like they want to make lots of money, or they have family here that they want to see. So those are the two reasons that I have seen. Because, I mean, basically you have to have a damned good reason to want to come to the U.S. if you're not a U.S. citizen, because it's really hard to now. And they don't make it very easy for you when you're here, right? or when you're in the U.S. either. Uh, there's one other thing I've seen uh, where Germans and other Europeans and even Asians come to the United States and that it's much easier to start your own company in the U.S. That's one thing that the U.S. has uh, that the, most of the rest of the world, uh, the governments get in the way of that. Um, so... Um, I was actually on the European Commission where they're asking a bunch of aliens like me and others uh, about our perspectives on that. So there are bureaucrats here that actually want to change that, but there's a lot of history in the way of that at the moment. All right. Any more questions? So if there are no more questions, that's fine because we are exactly in time. Oh, good, good, good. Um, that's okay. great. Oh, thank you. I think uh, we have to give a big thank you for this experience yes. that you shared it with us. All right. And, uh, and, and if you see my invisible friend walking around somewhere, give him a glass of water. <laughs> <laughs>